on a little bit before. I have a passion for uh, energy and in particular renewable energy and I think that'll be a big thing and, and, and a good space to invest in, and in particular if you have substantial money because of the need for Indonesia on that mm. aspect is immense. Um, health, I think again, is, is, is a no-brainer and it's a matter of getting uh, you know, uh, the quality uplifted and, and, and you know, different components to, to come together. And of course, the, the game that we sort of came out of and still do a lot and want to do a lot with is, is in, in, in property and, and real estate, but more into the ecotourism, sustainable yeah. projects, uh, you know, uh, how can you enhance existing villas to also have, you know, recirculation of water, soil yeah. and so on. Uh, but those three, I think, would be, would be my personal priority. You've reached the Seven Stones Indonesia podcast where we talk with business people, entrepreneurs and influencers in Bali and Jakarta about business in Indonesia. They share their visions and insights with us in conversations around why they do what they do, which we hope will inspire you to believe you too can have a positive impact and make a difference. We hope you enjoy what they have to say and if you do, please like, share and subscribe. Hi and welcome to another Seven Stones Indonesia podcast, uh, the first one of 2023. And today we're going to sit down with uh, Terry Nielsen from Seven Stones Indonesia. Welcome, Terry. And we're going to use this opportunity, first week of January, to look at what happened in 2022. Busy year for us, 2022. Yeah, I think for uh, Seven Stones it's been constant journey uh, over the last few years that I think we talked about also last year and even uh, 2022 for us saw a growth of I think 150 percent something like that yeah uh, which is substantial and, 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 and really good that we've expanded our operations into more locations in Bali uh, bigger office in Jakarta and have plans for a few other areas in Indonesia Lombok and Flores for this year very good very good so sort of you know we spend we spend quite a lot of time researching writing discussing meeting people about things that we think are relevant and important for particularly for people that are thinking about investing in Indonesia um, and a lot of things have actually happened in 2022 politically uh, that will impact and do impact the investment strategies that people have. Um, I guess the first biggest thing of 2022 was the omnibus <coughs> law. How, how, it was a hugely complicated document, you know, what, over a thousand pages or something like that. So I'm sure not many people actually got to read it, but what are the highlights of that in terms of the impact that it's supposed to have on attracting and encouraging investment? Well, I guess, like you say, it's a, it's a massive lift and a massive uh, kind of new umbrella, I guess, in the, in the legal system of Indonesia, in particular, how to set up companies, how to get different types of permits and so on. And even though the law itself was, was passed late 2020 into 2021, 2022 now we started to really see the impact of that and the sort of constant improvements in the OSS system that, that ties up to the omnibus law. Uh, right. So I think in general uh, the sort of confusion that we saw to begin with uh, you know among investors but also among the government because of a massive movement slowly slowly now uh, fades away and it gets easier and easier and a better and better understanding on, on, on the different aspects of once you've, you've set up your company and you're ready for the investments, how do you get the, the different permits and so on worked out and the system now works with like a three to four different levels of, of risk and if it's a low risk then right. you're good to go straight away. If it's a high risk, you know, it could be food related or something like that where you then need uh, you know, more specific permits and how that works out. But in general, we see it gets better and better and easier and easier and quicker and quicker, which is in accordance with, with why the, the government was motivated to do this. Uh, yeah, anyway. I mean, I mean, I've been, I've been on the research that I've been doing, been seeing some numbers that are really impressive, really, in, in terms of 
what the uptick has been on foreign direct investments and, and that sort of stuff. Obviously, everything is going to have some kind of impact on it. Would you say that the omnibus law was fully embraced and understood in terms of in terms of investments, or is it still a little bit grey? I think the omnibus itself is 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 clear. It may be some challenges and details that needs to be worked out uh, into the uh, legal system and how it sort of trickles down from the central government into provinces and regions and the execution of all of this and the understanding of it. Uh, as anything, I guess, you know, an investor being you know small or medium or a large investor. Uh, and the larger they get, they would spend more time investigating into it. And, and I think now that we see more and more, uh, they understand it better, they embrace it better, and they, they take the step on and large or their investments here or, or yeah. new entry coming into the market. And I think, like you said, there's many other reasons in addition to the omnibus law that has also uh, been beneficial for Indonesia and helped Indonesia not just step further up, but actually leap uh, up mm. into the international business community and uh, investment climate. Mm. I mean, what, the, as you say, I think there are a lot of a lot of things. You know, political stability has to be up there. The the steadiness of the economy has to be up there too. Um, they don't work singularly though. They they there's, they're connected. You know. The, the political stability has to be connected to the economy and the economy has to be connected to the political stability and you know all of these different things they're not standalone items are they? They, they there is and I think that's what we're trying to do with a lot of the work that we're doing is to try to take this you know 20,000 look 20,000 foot look of it and, and, and instead of like microing it we're actually looking at this bigger picture where there are a lot of things that are connected with this with this success yeah I think I think you're right and I think we we've written about this before and the sort of connecting the dots I guess is a good good terminology and how Indonesia now works on an overall strategy on, on, on how they want to <clears throat> increase the investment climate not just for foreign investment, but also domestic investments mm. in the general economy. Like, like, yeah, we we can see Wempam or small, medium, and micro enterprises yeah. is something that that several departments in the central government is really focused on and realize that uh, that has a massive impact on Indonesia's economy in the sense that sixty percent of it, its economy actually come from that. That which is which is an amazing and, number, well, actually, it's, isn't it's, it? It's extreme and and probably. 97% of the labor force is in those type yeah. of companies and businesses. So that I think has been one aspect. Uh, the sort of omnibus law uh, has been one impact that has also triggered more, um, you know, FDIs or foreign direct investments to a record high when we look at what uh, Backup M or the investment ministry talks about. Uh, political stability, yeah, I think We've seen that Indonesia is stable and, 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 you know, very little opposition, maybe from a political point of view, in good and bad, but, but it's been a unified sort of drive forward to, mm. to take Indonesia to the next level. And I think the few other aspects that I think is important is that Indonesia is also very clearly saying that they're politically, geopolitical neutral. I yeah. don't know of any state head like President Jokowi, he went to see China, he went to see the Americans, he went to see the Europeans, he went to see Russia, he went to see Ukraine, talked to everyone, obviously understands everyone, but are saying that Indonesia do not want to get into the sort of East, West, you know, Asian, European, whatever, whatever geopolitical conflicts and, and systems that, that are talked about. And I think that is also in what we saw possibly now a little bit with the conflict of what goes on in Europe and the war in Ukraine and also China and how they, uh, it became obvious that China was very, very dominant in certain products and items that during COVID became very obvious for mm. many countries. And I think that a lot of investors now are looking for a neutral you know, place to be. Uh, in addition to that, I think Indonesia also understands very well that they 
need to manage and preserve their own uh, assets as in commodities or, or different, like we've seen this with lithium, nickel, how you now have to enhance the product here before you export yeah. no longer take out the ore. And that I think will continue and, and, and forces then bigger investors to come in, like like a lot of the car producers now are looking at opportunities and already on the yeah. way in to produce batteries and, and, and even the cars here. So one thing is the, the uh, yeah, benefits or, or, or the Indonesian policies sort of in one way enforcing that, but two is also the Indonesian market itself. It grows substantially. Mm. There's 280 million people and I think you wrote about that where it's the country in the world that has the highest growth of what they define as as ultra rich. People. Yes. So so the yeah. massive massive potential to also actually sell the products that into an Indonesian market yeah. much easier. I mean, yeah. If you look at across the board, it, the growth has been quite impressive, really. And we're we're based in Bali most of the time. I know, I know you spend quite a lot of time up in Jakarta too, but like Bali is sort of home, if you like. Um, an economy that really relies heavily on tourism um, and other peripherally, peripheral businesses that, that are tapped into tourism. Uh, it's clear to see over the last 12 months in 2022, it's clear to see that the numbers of visitors here have been increasing both domestic and, and uh, foreigners. Um, and a lot of people are saying that Bali's economy is recovering because of this sort of uh, influx back of, of, of tourism. There are good things and there are bad things about that, I guess. And I think one of the most obvious bad things about that is the infrastructure and the way that the roads just in particular areas just aren't able to cope with all of these numbers of vehicles coming in again. What, what danger do you think there is of in negatively impacting the tourism industry here without addressing some basic infrastructure needs that the island's got? Well, I think, I think first of all, I agree that, that you know, this year we've seen a, a quick sort of, not full recovery, but, but massive movements towards recovery. We've seen that the government, both provincial and central, is, is, is driving a different type of tourism. They want more eco-friendly health tourism, which we might talk more about yeah. later. Uh, and, and other aspects that, that maybe will enhance a higher quality tourism, if we can use, use that word. Uh, but as we've seen, uh, we're far from recovered yet, and we have massive issues which pre-COVID maybe we forgot about, I don't know, through COVID, how bad it could be. And that, I think, is a massive challenge uh, that needs to be worked out. Yeah. Because as a tourist, you come here and you stay somewhere in Tabanan and you miss your flight back home because you get caught up in some silly traffic jam coming yeah. to Tango. I've even heard sad stories where people need to get hospitalized and the ambulance get caught up in, in, in traffic jams. Uh, so the convenience of that and the, 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 the sort of lack of flow, I think, is something we've talked about before and really, really needs to be addressed. And, and we hear now that there are going to be improvements on the existing network, mm. enlargement of the roads, maybe some parts of it can be straightened out. Uh, the main road, sort of Giliman of Mengui, has started, but maybe not yet full on. And to me, that is uh, more of a decision-making will to actually, yes, we need to do this, mm. who is going to finance it, is it a government, is it a private, or is it a combination, and, 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 and make this happen. It, it seems to take an awful lot of time, and I don't think Bali well, has the time to, to delay this any further in the sense that people are getting seriously upset, and in one way then, maybe in a organical way, that creates an overflow into the long box and the floors mm. and other places, which may not, may not be bad, but it may also mean that, that Bali in the end will, will lose out on substantial potential in tourism, yeah. which I don't think gains anyone. So it's tremendously important that those those aspects are addressed. Hey, talking of the, the tourism thing, I think one thing that, that was pretty noticeable, particularly <clears throat> towards the end of 2021 even, when, when we were kind of really in this 
low spot of the COVID saga thing. Uh, and tourist numbers here were low, you know, there weren't many people coming in and all that sort of stuff. But the one thing that, that seemed to be almost growing, if not growing, then at least pretty consistent, was this attraction for digital nomads. So we had a whole bunch of digital nomads that were coming in and they were staying for much longer periods of time. Um, and a lot of people that I was talking to were saying that without those guys there, in that really bad time for, for Bali, uh, the island would have suffered even more without those digital nomads. So much so that the digital nomad, you know, if you look at the digital nomad websites and that sort of thing, then Bali um, is certainly up there with, with it in the top three, and Changu is certainly up there in certain places to stay. Um, we're now looking at the possibility of a digital nomad visa and a lot of things around digital nomads. Do you think then that there's been this almost knee-jerk reaction to the digital nomad phenomenon instead of really looking at it in terms of long-term developing quality and again infrastructure around that, that 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 might be better suited than just try to get more bums in seats yeah i think i think the digital nomad has kind of became or become now a word similar to a backpacker it, it's not yeah. necessarily a high end tourism it's good yeah. in the sense that people stay for long term but but that sort of evolved then into what you call remote workers and and people that are no longer depending on being in an office or a location to, to, to do their job. And that is a market, I think, that grows tremendously and is good for Bali in the sense that people come in and, and, and reside themselves here and, and you know, uh, eventually uh, sets up businesses as well. Uh, but I think a lot of us ask those questions, how, how big is that market and how much should you do to go after them and what impact will that have towards the local economy mm. compared to, to other attempts? I think. We see countries like, like Thailand, who might have gone a bit further on that. Portugal, I heard in the news recently, Spain is doing something similar. And, and you'll get some, get some traction to that, that people will come. But, but I think what you really want is for people to, to comply. So when they come to an area, whether you're a digital nomad or not, you stay here for six months, that's fine. Then you're not a tax resident, so you can kind of move on. If you go beyond that, then I think you should, you should be in compliance and the government mm. should in my view, rather enhance uh, and make it easier for foreigners to set up, you know, private limited, because what you'll see then is that the tax implications and the tax, uh, uh, you know, r rates in Indonesia is very, very compatible with, with other countries, in particular in Europe mm -hmm. and the US. So a lot of these people will actually, oh, I can build my foreign clients sitting in Indonesia, pay less taxes than what I do in Europe or mm. US. Uh, and that way, I think it'll be a, a much better impact because you'll get them in the sense that they'll stay and they'll, they'll eat and drink and live here, uh, but you'll also get uh, taxable income on it. Mm. And I, I think the danger is that you go that far for a group of people, for people like us and others who is trying to be in compliance and doing the right thing and wanting to contribute, we go like, well, what, what about us? You know, we've contributed for years and years and years. Mm. So I, I, I don't think personally that, that that's the right way to go. And I think not only Indonesia, hopefully, but also other countries will realize that now you, you, you've got to have a, you want to attract people to come in, but that sort of short term market, I don't think is the yeah. way to go and it's become a trend because I think a lot of the, call them digital nomads or whatever it is, they're also very active into social media and it becomes a bit of a narrative of, of what you have to do, but it's not, it's very difficult to say, it's X, Y, set of the market, and therefore we should mm. react to it. It, it. To me, it's more a, a yeah, knee-jerking reaction yeah. to, to something that isn't clearly defined yet. Is, is that a, a similar a similar sort of scenario, do you think, with the uh, clearly increasing numbers of Russian and Ukraine Ukrainian visitors to Bali? You know, since this conflict started in, when was that, February? started last year um, we've seen numbers of Russian clients coming to us and number of, of Russian businesses starting up not through us but generally definitely on the definitely on the rise um, 
Are we, are we looking at that market in the same way that we would look at a digital nomad or a remote worker market? Or do you see there being sort of maybe more long-term impacts and implications? I think to begin with, uh, <clears throat> we could see a few people obviously panicking and leaving the countries for obvious reasons in the conflict. Uh, slowly, slowly, I think, you know, we kind of say Russian speaking, that means Ukrainians, Belarus, Russians, you know, and, and possibly other countries too, that they were looking for places to actually uh, move their businesses and mm. move their lives out of these areas. Um, and to begin with, uh, Bali was more or less a destination where you go for three months, six months to a stage now where they figure out that that's actually a place where you can do business, mm. base your business. And I think, again, on the geopolitical aspect, Indonesia is neutral in that and have a long-term standing relationship with Russia, which they, which they wish to retain. So there is no sentimentals uh, with Russians coming in regardless of being tourist or, or, or wanting to live here. Mm. So we see more and more you know, high-end individuals and, and, and companies that looks at establishing branches and possibly also uh, moving their business. Yeah. Um, and there's pros and cons with that, as in any market we can talk about, you know, mass tourism from China and India, zero-dollar tourism, all of that, uh, because of the sentiment that some people seem to have an issue with Russians, but we forget that they're actually humans and, you know, want to have a life like everyone yeah. else, and they should. Yeah. And, and I think it's encouraging that Indonesia actually, uh, you know, do that in a, in, a, in a good way. Some people fear that we'll get very dominant Russian communities in good and bad, like we maybe see some trends around specific communities and areas in Ubud uh, and other areas. And I, I, I don't think that that's so much of an issue, like, like I had a dialogue with a Australian online the other day along those lines and kind of compared the figures that we wrote about that for December, you had something like 15,000 Russians coming in, you had 70,000 Australians. Yeah. And then the next argument was like, oh, all the Russians come for business and the Aussies come for a holiday. And there might be some truth to that, but, but not that significant. And I think still you'll see that the business community area is dominant by, by you know, Europeans and Australians mm. who so have been here for a yeah. longer time. And we just got to, you know, get used to and accommodate that, that market yeah. as well. And yeah. I mean, Bali's always been good at that. Yeah. It's always been good at adapting to outside influences. I mean, even from the days of, you know, when Charlie Chaplin and, and, and that ilk of, of Hollywood stars were coming here on holidays. I mean, the influence that those guys had on here is still, we still, we still feel it today, but it feels Balinese. It's, it's, Bali's Bali, got this really nice quirky way of taking somebody else's idea and making it a part of their own culture actually yeah, i think you know that, that sort of you know gado gado as it would be in a niche in the mixed yeah. uh, vegetable mix and you know we, yeah. we're all from different areas but we we we, we you know accommodate each other and, and yeah mingle well with each other so you take the, the you cherry pick the best bits out of it and make make good use of those and then throw the bad bits away you know <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I guess for, for if, we, if we wind up 2022 before we get on to 2023, I guess the, the single biggest event for 2022, and I, and I think probably the single biggest event for Bali possibly ever, or to date at least, is, was the G20. Um, which, as you know, wasn't just one series of meetings. The meetings that were around the G20 were going on for months and months ahead of, of November. Um, but it certainly put Indonesia in the spotlight internationally and very much, in, in, I think, regionally um, as a, a, not necessarily a force to be reckoned with, but certainly not somebody that you could ignore. You know, I think I think Jokowi's done a really good job in, in his administration. I think the respect that he gained, particularly through the G20, the success of the G20, I think that really that really showed people that this is a place that you can start to trust more. This is a place that you could create new things. You could you could expand your business opportunities and things like that. You know. So G G20 was good, I think. Well, absolutely, I think I think there is many takeaways from that. Like, like you said, you know, the world suddenly kept hearing Indonesia as the sort of head of G20. Uh, 
and it really put it on the map in, in, in many ways. And in addition, the, the massive, can almost call it PR work that the president himself yeah. had done traveling around uh, pre, you know, G20, but also as a build up to G20 to make sure it would be a successful event. And the exposure of that is immense. You could see the financial commitments too that the the world and nations, other other G20 and non G20 uh, countries that that was part of some of these events too. One example of that is like renewable energy, where Indonesia now is on a path to be carbon neutral by 2060. And when you look at the figures, they need $30 billion every year in investments for this. That adds up to an epic $1.1 trillion just in one, and obviously renewable energy is a big thing. <clears throat> but the world then said, yeah, we, we will we'll support Indonesia. Yeah. The country is a big economy, and there were uh, grants and commitments worth of $20 billion just to yeah. renewable energy. I think another aspect of that, and again, the, the public relation aspect of how driven the president is to satisfy the international community, not in, not in a bad way that all will do anything to get investors in, but, but get them to understand that Indonesia is a nation to count on. And when you look at that sort of whole atmosphere, and in particular, the dinner they had together, all the state heads, uh, some of them couldn't show up because they had a bad stomach and there was other, other reasons, but, but that whole atmosphere, you could see they were so relaxed, they laughed, they yeah. spoke, they chit-chatted, they kind of hanged out after the dinner and entertainment was sort of, sort of over. So it was like, I can't think of any mm. event that that has actually happened. And I think it put these nations together in a different way that they may not have experienced. You yeah. Know? wish for like Putin you should have been there too and you know maybe yeah. an outcome would have come of, of that too I don't know but 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 yeah definitely everyone went back from that with good memories and, and, and good exposure uh, and, a, and a lot of commitments too there was there was you know commitment particularly for the what do they call it the um with the marine and, and not the blue, is it the blue, blue economy, the blue economy? Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of commitments to that. Lot, lots of commitments to a lot of good things, yeah. actually. Financial commitments yeah. as well as political commitments. Yeah. So it's pretty good. And now, and now that, that Indonesia's handed that presidency over to India, uh, it then stepped into the presidency of ASEAN. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things going around and being spoken about about ASEAN and how powerful this block is and you know how the, the, the global sort of geopolitical shift is moving away from the West and the Atlantic and the European nations and moving mu much more to the East and to the Asian nations and ASEAN is, is a driver in that and I think Indonesia's presidency of that is going to be another interesting year ahead you know. Yeah I think, I think again we'll see Indonesia promote their, you know, geopolitical uh, independency and, and neutral position. Uh, Jokowi over and over says we should, should not have conflicts, we should not have wars. Uh, he takes that further to say like in Indonesian Satara, you know, it, it, we've got to be leveled. So when we do mutual agreements, it's got to have benefits. It can't yeah. be one part taking advantage of the other, which kind of reminds a little bit about uh, you know, when Indonesia had its independence, and Sukarno talked about the non bloc uh, alliance of, of nations not being part of these blocs, mm. saying that it's got to be fair, colonialism is over, you know, the mm. dominance of certain parts of the world is, is, is over, it's got to be leveled. And I think that uh, pulls a lot of respect, you know, uh, from any part of the world. And, 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 and Indonesia, and, and, and maybe in particular Jokowi, became becomes a symbol of that, that sort of leadership in many ways. Do you think it's kind of off topic a little bit, but kind of related? Um, Indonesia's been trying to get into the BRICS association, you know, the, uh, the alternative to the petro petrodollar. Um, do you think they'll get in? I think that depends on Indonesia, whether they want or not. And that's kind of like a, a geopolitical related decision. Uh, I, Personally, I think that in some shape or form, they're already into it and will we'll continue to explore that. And I think you also see uh, as an impact of the embargoes, <clears throat> right or wrong, towards what, what, what happened with Russia or what happens with Russia because of the Ukraine uh, conflict uh, has made a lot of big nations, India, China, Indonesia, many other 
countries too, thinking that we need to have an independent system. We need to be able to trade with our partners independently. This time it's a war and it may not be justified and that shouldn't happen, but next time it might be for political reasons. Mm. We want to be able to, to trade independently. So I think you see more and more countries, Indonesia talks to Russia, and China and Brazil and South Africa and other nations to develop independent systems of, of exchange of, of currency, uh, finance and, and, and also mm. trade. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll see that, uh, you know, continuing into 2023. And I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, you know, it's a good thing that we get more, yeah. again, leveled um, power, if anything. Yeah. Yeah. That actually feeds the next section of this quite nicely because it's kind of going to look at 2023 in a little bit more detail and, and particularly um, investment opportunities in 2023. We, uh, you know, we, we've just submitted the, the thing for Indonesia Expat and we're going to expand it into another couple of parts to the, to the series, if you like. But we identified seven key areas that we think I mean, this isn't giving financial advice because you know that's we, we don't do that kind of thing we just sort of share information and knowledge that, that, that we get but we identified seven really real key areas um, <coughs> for 2023 um, I'll, I'll just read the seven areas out but we can you know dive into whichever one you think is the most appropriate but these are areas of investment opportunity for 2023 and beyond. Um, healthcare and medical tourism, pretty much everything that's digital, so that's FinTech and, and, and a whole bunch of other crypto related things. Infrastructure, so airports, ports, roads, harbors. Education, renewable energy and electric vehicles, which ties into the, to the nickel and the lithium thing. Tourism, not just Bali, but, but tourism across the archipelago and property investments. So out of those seven things, where do you want to start? Healthcare, digital, infrastructure, education, renewables, tourism or property? Well, I think, I think you know, all of them we can talk for, for hours and hours. Uh, but to me, the passion, I guess, for seven stones into Jakarta would be renewable energy and probably waste management because of the need and the commitment mm. that Indonesia shows to, to have these aspects uh, cleaned up and, and, and improved. Uh, health, tourism and property uh, will be focused a lot on Bali, so I kind of see those as connected. Um, anything else, infrastructure, tech, all of this, you know better than I do that that when you look at Southeast Asia, Indonesia alone will be a 50% of the market in almost anything. Yeah. Uh, and in some areas, maybe maybe even more. Uh, but to me, I think, yeah, the, the renewable energy, uh, the health tourism, the property in general for Bali is, is, is very interesting and potentials. Uh, how, how, could, um, how could somebody sitting at home watching this let's say they're in the UK or they're in Australia or, or in the States, and they're listening to this and, and we're kind of triggering something in, in, in their thought processes. And they're looking at places to invest and they want to invest in healthcare in Indonesia. How would you, how would you advise people to move forward with that? I, I think there are, um, it's still early for, for the healthcare, but, but I think what we're looking at is that when the World Bank advised Indonesia on, on you know, ease of business, one was the bureaucracy, and that's where the omnibus comes in, the infrastructure, mm. which we've seen a massive uh, change and development, roads, harbors, whatever it is, it's just, just massive what's happened. Uh, then it was education, uh, and you can see now slowly, slowly, uh, foreign-based uh, universities are, are looking at establishing themselves. Healthcare is, is, is similar in the sense that what Indonesia look at with that is that uh, when you look at, call it health tourism, uh, of Indonesians going to Singapore, it's probably 50% of the market. Malaysia, 70%, and I think they estimate, as the Minister of Tourism told us, an $11 billion capital flight wow. itself. So that obviously then triggered uh, a thought process in Indonesia, we got to stop that. And uh, with that comes then the health tourism, in particular for Bali, where now they are developing a special economical zone in, in, in 
Sanur, which will have some big international clinics, but also after what, what I hear will allow for uh, different types of clinics to also come in and, and, and set up in a special economical zone. Uh, I think outside of that too, people will set up uh, clinics and hospitals and different aspects of, of the sort of medical range, mm. anything from you know the traditional allopathic sort of way of doing medicine, then you have functional medicine, which, which is a fairly new terminology, holistic health and wellness, where Bali is already well established. Uh, and I guess the big sort of question mark with that is then uh, credibility. And a few things that we looked at and kind of surprised us is when you look at doctors, Indonesian doctors in particular, that are practicing in Indonesia. And also when you look at hospitals in Singapore, Thailand and Malaysia, a lot of them are Indonesian. Mm. So there is a lot of qualified, there's something in the systems that makes them go away, maybe better salaries and so on. And probably some of these will come back. And in addition to that, Indonesia is also realizing that we actually don't have enough doctors and we don't have enough uh, uh, you know, specialties and certain types of, of medical treatments and so on. And therefore now are easing up on regulations where in particular within the special economic zones, but possibly beyond that, they will allow uh, you know, foreigners to mm. actually practice. Um, and the resistance of that in the Indonesian system may or may not be still strong, but I think if it's presented in a way with the benefits that it, this prevents for the impact that it can have in the mentioned capital flight, the general sort of uplift of, of Indonesians and, and, and their health and and then, you know, foreign doctors coming in with transferring knowledge and, 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 and yeah. skills, I think, you know, that, that more and more uh, will realize that this, this is the way to go and yeah. necessary to go. I, I, I hope I hope they figure it out because I, I agree. I think there's with the population that we've got here, um, the the ratio of, of people to doctors and medical facilities is not is not particularly impressive right now, and I think it does lead to a lot of different opportunities within that field. Um, I'm not sure exactly you know, how that would be worked out with the legalities of it, particularly with the foreign doctors and nurses. But, you know, we've discussed this in the past and yeah, according to certain opinions on regulations, foreign doctors and nurses are already allowed to practice here. It's a fairly you know? new regulation. I think it'll need some time to be clear to define what that means and not and what, what specialties or not that that, that that can be done with. But I think yeah. we'll see that. Uh, it's different now from maybe just a year back or two years or three years back in the sense that the seven central government also as part of G20 have this global health commitment yeah. to, to have a unified uh, approach to, to, to challenges and obviously then need to, to uplift the domestic yeah. aspects uh, as part of that. So, so they are on it in a way that we could see with infrastructure, we could see it with omnibus law, now it's, it's about healthcare and, and I think that it'll be driven through regardless uh, and, and, and it makes sense. You know, yeah. financially it makes sense. Health of people, like one of the issues or challenges that Indonesia has is that it, it, it has what, what's called PPGS or the sort of health insurance and pension fund that when that was made uh, available for everyone, uh, the government kind of like looked at, oh, there's so much more people being sick than in the past, which obviously doesn't make sense. And what do make sense is that people in the past that would go home and just write the illness off back home mm. or simply die and now seek medical help. So the cost has gone up and the government needs to do something. And that leads to all kinds of other triggers into that. You know, why are people sick? Oh, it's pollution. It's, it's, it's cigarette smoking that we can see now single cigarette sales now. So yeah. it's going to be forbidden limitations on access to, to sales and cigarettes. Yeah. And the next you'll probably see on food. Food needs to be really looked at. You know, sugar, all these aspects is coming one, one by one. So all these, uh, you know, triggers will then obviously open up opportunities to invest into clinics, to invest into hospitals, to invest into investment companies that specialize. On that. On, on, on that, it's definitely under that umbrella. I mean, I was reading something 
I'm not sure if I, I put it into the latest story or not, but I was certainly reading something about how at the G20, Jokowi's talking about healthcare um, in terms of medical supply chains and, and how developing countries, particularly Indonesia, can really make use of being a, a significant player in the supply chain, manufacturing devices, producing devices, distributing devices all across the world, because most of those actually now are imported, they're all foreign, they're all foreign imports. So he's kind of looking at it, I think, um, not just in terms of sitting down with the doctor and the stethoscope and the traditional medicine things, but I think he's looking at healthcare in terms of, a, of an, an industry in a bigger sense, you know? That's all the equipment, that's all, that's, you know... Yeah, no, I agree, and I think, you know, the, yeah, the equipment, uh, you know, whatever uh, medical needs, and none of us are doctors, but, but also uh, medical aspects, you know, medicine, supplements whatever it is indonesia can definitely play, yeah. play a role and, and again the world became aware of when when the sort of lockdowns happen and you know uh <clears throat> logistics were were difficult you know that they realized that all of this is or most of it is produced in china and it needs to be from a risk perspective to be balanced out mm. there is opportunities that, that indonesia looks at and definitely can grab and part of that is a general uplift of the yeah. health system yeah. I mean, if, if anyone's listening to this um, and wants some good ideas for, for healthcare, we've got some actually. And one of them is to kind of uh, repurpose uh, some of the facilities that you get in four and five star hotels and resorts, particularly down in Nusa Dua. Um, Tourist numbers aren't the same as they were. The idea of mass tourism isn't as popular as it used to be. So you're getting into the quality aspect of tourism. That means that some 400, 500 hotel rooms, you know, down in down in New City aren't going to be as full as they used to be. How could you turn that around a little bit? And, and what we've been talking about is maybe repurposing some of those floors for clinics or medical services and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the. There's a few aspects to this that when you look at Bali uh, becoming a health tourism destination to sort of pick up and compete against the Thailand, the Malaysia, you know, India, other nations doing this uh, is a time thing and it's going to need time and, and, and Indonesia is ready to take on that battle and, and they'll, they'll be successful in it. But <clears throat> there is an opportunity for Indonesia to sort of cut through that a bit and, and drive an additional aspect of that, which which I guess is called functional medicine. Sometimes uh, you, you talk about you know uh, other aspects of it, but but this is a fairly new terminology that I think came to be around 1990, and now evolves into actually the fastest growing aspect of of medicine, and it's more towards preventive wellness, kind of looking at your whole body mm. as, as, as a system and, and looking at the causes of your illness, not just the illness itself, but there's a reason for why you have cancer, there's a reason yeah. why you have different types of illnesses and they may not, you know, so, so, so that's what it's looking at and I think that's an aspect that, that Indonesia can, can, can push themselves up and forward into it. In addition to that, um, I know our friend Ross Woods is also putting a lot of energy and studies into the retirees and seeing that as a potential. So. Maybe there is a, a uh, combination of those aspects where you can get a clinic, uh, and I know some hotels will be like, oh, that's doctors and hospitals, and we don't want that, but it's more of a wellness clinic in the sense that <clears throat> people will come for these treatments, they'll stay at the hotel, they'll enjoy the food or the special dietary that they're put on, and the clinic itself is more like a spa. Well, yeah. so it's not an intrusive aspect yeah. where you operate people and so on. So I think that the, the hotels will embrace that and that combined with then retirees who, yeah. who will need this too, more of a health optimization. You know, we talk to a different few companies who is uh, doing this really well and they're all very excited about looking at the opportunities to come in, to come into yeah. it. And with that, you look at a uh, an easier market for many perspectives in the sense that they won't stay the three to four days that was was the sort of trend uh, prior to COVID. They'll stay for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and you get the add-ons of upselling them into treatments and, yeah. MB and so on, which which makes the financial yeah. aspect more achievable. And you're right, I think that some of these hotels, uh, you know, it, 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 it it's 
something from the past. You know, people don't come to a 600, 800 hotel anymore and sort of sit about around the pool, read a book and drink pina coladas. They want more of the mm. experiences. Mm. They want privacy and, you know, they, they need to think differently. And I think that might be a uh, solution for them to, 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 yeah. to re- yeah, think the strategy uh, towards retirees. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, what I think one of the hottest topics, not just in Indonesia, but I think around the world right now, is to do with renewables and this this huge push towards electric vehicles. And I know that um, that again from the research and the writing, we know that that, that Indonesia is really committed to. Um, being on the cutting edge of that in many respects, not just for the vehicles themselves, but also for the batteries and, and a lot of the other peripheral things that go around with all of that. Um, the targets that, that Indonesia has set are actually really ambitious, you know, to, to have quite a large, well, I think it's in the 20, 25% or 23% of, of all vehicles within the next two years. You know, it's not. This isn't like a. Uh, we'll we'll do it in in twenty years' time. These guys are, are, are looking at pushing it forward really rapidly, and I think there's g massive opens openings and opportunities for people to get in on that. I I fully agree, and I think I think sometimes we see this. Oh, Indonesia. You know, they haven't done it in the past. They're not going to do it this time. I, I, I that that kind of makes me just smile and, and, and slowly walk away from those con conversations because in is committed in a totally different way and I think what yeah. we see and how they do this they like an example the omnibus law over a couple of years was created and put into play and it created issues and challenges but in is willing to take that because they know that the the output will come quicker and better and I think in renewable energy batteries uh, electrical vehicles that we talk about they're doing the same I can see from some of the seminars and the, the sort of presentations and whatever we join that there seem to be a, a uh, not a disbelief, but a lack of confidence from foreign investors that Indonesia actually will do it and they see resistance and regulations. Mm. But to me, that is a time thing and where, where Indonesia will enforce this through the regulations and the central government then comes in and you, you will see the tipping point that we've seen on Omnibus, that we've seen on other aspects. Yeah. And it will happen. And right now we might be, in particular for renewable energy, a little bit behind the targets, but I think that will catch up and, 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 and gain momentum. I, I, I see, what I see as well, Terry, is, is political will. I, I, I really get the impression that there is, a, there is political will behind this move towards renewables and a cleaner sort of environment, much more so than you might see in some more well-known Western countries that are kind of waving bigger flags and all of that. There doesn't seem to be the same, you know, genuine, let's go ahead and do it for the benefit of the people kind of feeling that you get here. You know, I, I get the feeling off a lot of what, what Jacoby and his administration are, are doing and, and talking about and things. There's, there's genuine, we want to help the country kind of feeling to it, you know? I think, I think you're, you're right in that, that the drive is, is, is pride and it, it, it's in many ways a shortcut for Indonesia to, to lift itself up, you know, as a, as a much more credible yeah. nation and, 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 and economy and attracting, you know, the future uh, investments because of that um, and I think that kind of leads a little bit to like political will that where does it come from you know is Indonesia stable and so on and I think we we write about this and we talk about this and to me I, I think Indonesia is way beyond point of no return when it comes in terms of you know unstable politics Indonesia has actually never been very unstable mm. except for you know uh, when Soharto stepped down in 1998 and you know, the, the sort of back in 65 since then, it's actually been tremendously stable. Yeah. A little bit of demonstrations and things going on every now and then, but nothing substantial. And I think now that you get this sort of question mark on opposition and not when we look at the last elections back in 2019, which was like, you know, 52, 48 between the two camps. What happened after that was for maybe many Western countries mind-blowing in the sense that the opposition as in the presidential and vice president candidate, both of them got positions as ministers in, in the new government. 
and therefore uh, that sort of reduced the, I guess, oppositions and resistance in the sort of Indonesian terminology of Gotong Royong working mm. together came came to work, and, and, and through the last few years we've seen that, wow, this really works. We get things done. We're unified, and there's now talks about can that be a tradition for Indonesia that if if there is a couple of candidates out there battling out and the winner integrates the, the, the losing part into the new government. Uh, that I think would be we good, you know, and you Oh, I think uh, it's a smart it's a smart yeah. way to, to kind of yeah. get you know, the, the, a lot of a lot of places are saying, you know, we the people, you know, the government is a representative of the people and they're elected in and, and a lot of these are just empty promises that these politicians make and they don't really Nothing give happens, two yeah. hoots about the people that have elected them. They just want the power and they want the position and, and that sort of stuff. But I do get I do get the feeling here with the way that the system that you're describing is that it doesn't matter whether you're against us or, or you're from a different political party, when when push comes to shove and it's at the end of the day, what are we going to do together? How are we going to collaborate to be able to make things better for everybody? And by embracing the opposition, if you like, I think you're, you're helping more people. No, I think... You're not alienating a lot of people, you know? No, I, think, I think nations could actually learn from that. And, and I think Denmark now was a country who had a, what do you call it, a centralized government where it have elements from the traditional left mm. and right actually coming together. And, and, and you can see Denmark is a small country compared to Indonesia, but their economy and what they do is, is, is mm. immense. And it's a strong, strong country in that part of the world that consists of already strong, strong nations. So it's an interesting concept. But I think another aspect when you look at Indonesia too, from that angle is that traditionally the president has chosen a vice president from uh, maybe Muslim circles in the sense that Indonesia is a very much a Muslim country or that's the dominant religion um, and that seemed to fade away in the sense that Indonesia has never had a tradition of mixing religion and politics and they're more nationalistic and in their sort of constitutional um, uh, belief everyone has a right to believe whatever they want so that seemed to now shift more towards the vice president should be a business person that can actually make sure that Indonesia runs as a as a as a business as a business, or at least can encourage you know investments to yeah. to, to come in. Uh, so that's going to be exciting to see now. Uh, obviously, we're in twenty twenty three, but twenty twenty four we're going to have. Who? That, that, we're, we're jumping ahead a little bit on that, but elections in twenty twenty four. Who do you see as being uh, sort of front runners on that? But more importantly. Um, any changes to the current system and, and, and administration, are they going to have positive or negative impacts for people that want to do investments here or already have investments here? I, I think that, that in general, uh, I believe in Indonesia as a point of no return and the sort of platform or increase in the way the government helps and supports its people and encourages investments and so on is uh, at a level where regardless of who comes in and if he or she doesn't doesn't uh, follow in those footsteps, I think they'll have an issue. Mm. Um, I also think that what we talked about, that sort of collaboration is something that everyone has benefited from business-wise and, and the people in the country as a whole. Uh, and it's made everyone realize that we should, we should continue with that. Uh, today they, they talk about, you know, Prabowo will they run again, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, Ganjar, which is the, now the governor of Central Java, seemed to be a people's preferred candidate. You have people like uh, Anis, who is maybe more popular in, in, in the sort of Muslim circles and, and what, what's out there in terms of opposition. But there may be others, and I think we'll see that that will continue to, to, to sort of heat up and build up a bit towards the election. Mm. Uh, but we also need to remember that you actually need a threshold of 20% in the National Assembly to be able to uh, push forward a candidate and that means a lot of the political parties, I think PDIP is the only political party who can do that alone. It's everyone got else, the numbers yeah, on its own. Everyone else will need to have different types of coalition mm. to, to work that out and then I think we'll see a process down to maybe two candidates and, and, and a peaceful election and, yeah. and, and we'll continue. In, in some respects though, yes there's elections, it's every five years right here. Yeah. yeah. Um, in some respects, with, with these elections every five years, 
things don't really change that much because there are 25 year plans. So you've got five years of one administration, maybe they have a second term, they do another five years, but then you're gonna have another administration, maybe from the opposite side of the camp, da, 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 da. so different ways of thinking about stuff. But they're all following the same 25 year plan. They've all got the same five year priorities and it doesn't, so it doesn't really matter who's in, right? Yeah, there is some difference, <laughs> I guess, and in, in, in maybe it's not so much in Indonesia, but if you look at European countries and it sort of shifts between left to right, and I can see from my own. Yeah, and it starts like and stops and it doesn't go anywhere. Really. Have a, not, a, not a right wing, but on the right side of the sort of Norway, I think everyone is a socialist, regardless of what who you vote for, but, but it has changed and you can see there's some changes in, in, in tax policies and other aspects. And you might see a little bit of that in Indonesia, but I think a lot less in the sense that uh, that sort of 25 years plan or, you know, how far into it we are uh, is committed to and yeah. stay on that. And again, yeah. we've seen that the last 10 years we've had a massive uh, drive forward with with Dukowie and I think that that will continue. See what what the reason I kind of went down that path is because sort of this second segment out about those seven sort of key areas that that, that are potential not just for foreign direct investments but also for domestic investors to, to get involved with those seven different categories. Those are the same essentially the same areas that that have been part of these five year plans for quite some time, you know, the improvement of healthcare, the, the improvement of infrastructure and development of ports and roads and access, education is there, alternative energy is there, it's been there for years. All of these things are actually, and this is why I find it kind of exciting and interesting and intriguing as well, is that you've got all of these things that have been in play for quite some time. And I, I'd have to say that Jokowi's leadership has really kind of uh, given it juice, it's really kind of made it a lot more, uh, a lot more accessible to a lot more people. A lot more people are kind of getting involved and believing in it. But it's essentially the same policies in these 25-year plans, and those a those aspects have been what the governments prior to this one have been trying to do, and they probably will continue to do. And I just, I just think it's so encouraging that that, you know, we're we're saying okay, everything digital is worth investing in. Well, fintech, and we just published that article about fintech and its growth in Indonesia. It's mind-numbing the numbers. You know, how many people are, are, are being serviced by these fin financial technology applications and all that sort of stuff. But what was super interesting about doing that research was that even though those numbers are really impressive, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars worth of business and all of the opportunities in that, it's still a small percentage of the of the country that's being serviced, meaning that the doors are wide open for massive investment and and you know adapting to those ideas and, and running with those ideas. Well, I, think, I think that's 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 very true, and I think that uh, you're right that that when we look at the sort of drive for the bigger picture and the long term commitment and planning. What happens now would have happened regardless, and it's happened quick, mm. possibly because of Jokovi. And, and you then get to what, what, what we talk a bit about too, you get to a tipping point where everything just becomes easier and easier because education picks up, health system picks up, uh, you know, the masses comes behind it. Uh, it, it. It's just yes, 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 and yes. And, and then you really look at, like, like I think we mentioned too, that Indonesia now is hitting what, what we call a golden age similar to maybe what Korea has had, Japan has had, and other nations has had, but Indonesia dwarfs those potentials just because of the size of mm. it, you know, the population, the resources, and everything else around it, and why you can see where the sort of expectations of Indonesia being the fourth largest economy in the world was said to be 2050. Now I think we talk about 2030, it might even happen before I think that. it's before, yeah. yeah. Because of all these, these aspects, so that, becomes an eye opener, not 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 and we keep saying this too, just for foreign investment, but also domestic players 
that will tend to 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 invest domestically yeah. because of the potential in their own. Well, and especially when you look at some of the latest research coming out of of how many millionaires and billionaires are being created every year, Jakarta's way up there with the big boys. A lot of millionaires and a lot of billionaires. There's a lot of money floating in and out of Jakarta. You know. Yeah. I think I think it's 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 super interesting. But you know, we 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 started out um, Seven Stones Indonesia seven years ago. Today, so this is 2023 is our seventh year anniversary. So maybe we should do something on the seventh of the seventh, 23, or maybe maybe something silly like that. But we started out as a property business, and uh, it's still a part of what we do. What would be your outlook for property in 2023? Do you see it as, as moving in a, a positive direction? Do you see it being overdeveloped, need more spatial planning? How does infrastructure fit in with all of that? You know, how, how do you see it moving? I think it depends a little bit on what, what market that you talk about. And I think maybe if we start with Jakarta, that, that still has a oversupply in, in, in both probably apartments, residences and, and commercial space. And, sort of triggered our work from home and less dependency on offices might have made that worse, but then you'll see probably some kind of repositioning and, you know, the other concepts that, that will come along. And then Jakarta is Jakarta. People will still come there for business, even though you know, mm. the new sort of capital being pushed forward step by step. Uh, so I think it will find its way and you can already see uh, encouraging reports and predictions coming out from, from the sort of big, big uh, uh, companies that moves in that space. Uh, for Bali, I think we see now a growth and a development that I don't think we've seen since 2014 and we still wow. aren't fully recovered. It's still kind of focused on some areas, you know, Tango into Tabanan, uh, Bukit, Uluwatu and, and then Ubud. But I think the combination of tourism, you need, you need accommodations for them. Uh, much more people want to live here, short-term, long-term, residential aspect. And when, when people like us, we go like, oh, it's so expensive. It's went up with hundreds, maybe thousands of percentages in, in certain areas. But if you then compare Bali to you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, places in Europe, you can have a tiny little apartment and here. You can build yourself two villas, live in one and, mm. and rent the others out and, and have a massive lifestyle change. So I think mm. that in, in that sense, it's still undervalued and we'll still see. And, and undervalued? Yeah, I think it's undervalued in the sense that the cost of land is still inexpensive compared to many, many other places. Mm. Uh, cost of construction is still inexpensive or less uh, you know, costly than, than other places. And, and then the, the rates that you can get on renting out long-term or short-term or you're residing here and the, the, the cost of life or lifestyle is, is, is mm. a lot better than, than in other countries. All these aspects is, I think now people see more and more. So I think for Bali in particular and, and, and then the overflow into other tourist destinations like, like Lombok and Flores and some of the other uh, you know, uh, dedicated areas that the government, they call it the super, super priority yeah. destination, yeah. will we'll also see a good uplift. And, in most areas, the government is doing the right thing, putting in the infrastructure, you know, improving airports, roads, harbors, hotels, and so on. Uh, how, how, how important in all of that, doesn't really matter what sector it is, but throughout all of it, how important is education and thinking about Again, you know, the whole purpose of today's conversation really is to kind of talk about investment opportunities and, and to kind of paint this picture of actually Indonesia is a good place to invest. It's stable, it's got growth, it's got momentum, it's got global attraction and all those sorts of things. But, but in all of those ideas and in all of those initiatives, education's got to be a really fundamental key. Without it, you're always going to be relying on outside people to, to, to sort of be your brain of it, yeah. you know? So education in terms of investments, what opportunities are there if somebody wants to kind of get into educational investments? Because we've spoken about vocational training schools and, and uh, franchises for universities and that sort of thing. They're, they're actually quite big scale projects. 
is it is that the where is that where education investment is? Is it big scale or is there opportunity for you know smaller mom and pop? operations to work? I think both. I think, you know, you have formal and non-formal uh, education and I think non-formal, we see that more and more, you know, online based uh, types of classes and courses appearing and a lot of that is locally driven. Some of it is also foreign driven in the sense of concepts that are proven abroad, mm. gets brought into Indonesia. Uh, Joko, we did, a, I think, a good move in, in appointing Nadim as the Minister of Education <laughs> in the sense that he is the man behind Gojek and now also Tokopedia. So he's a man that understands the possibilities that technology has. Mm. I guess the challenge is in a very old fashioned maybe education system for teachers and how they need to be trained to be able to train the, their own people. But again, it, it's a little bit like the uh, health aspect that we talked about. Indonesia has a substantial capital flight of people going out studying US, Europe, Australia and so on which is good in the sense that they come back with a, uh, you know, uh, more balanced view of, of, of where the world is heading. Uh, but we also see there that you see now interest for, for foreign universities to actually mm. come in and, 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 and do joint campuses with existing universities, uh, franchising out, whatever it is. And, and, and I think we'll, we'll see a continued uplift on, on that. And, and, and we know that here in Bali and some other universities, you'll actually see foreigners coming in to get a doctor's degree. We talk about health, like yeah. Indians, there's a quite a substantial figure of, 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 of them coming in to, to get medical education and go back and practice in their own country. So that I think is also something that, that Indonesia could you know, become, uh, and in particular maybe Bali, because it has an attraction as a place to be, to, to be a place where yeah. students actually would want to come if they could get the quality that they can get in, in other countries. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so just to sort of wind it up a little bit, Terry, if you had a crystal ball and a magic wand and not unlimited resources, but substantial resources, where would you put your money? Uh, Investment wise. I think I would, would play in a few things. I, I think we talked about a little bit before. I have a passion for uh, energy and in particular renewable energy and I think that'll be a big thing and, and, and a good space to invest in and in particular if you have substantial money because of the need for Indonesia on that mm. aspect is immense. Um, health I think again is, is, is a no-brainer and it's a matter of getting uh, you know uh, the quality uplifted and, and, and you know different components to, to come together. And of course, the, the game that we sort of came out of and still do a lot and want to do a lot with is, is in, in, in property and, and real estate, but more into the ecotourism, sustainable yeah. projects, uh, you know, uh, how can you enhance existing villas to also have, you know, recirculation of water, solar panels yeah. and so on. Uh, but those three, I think, would be, would be my personal priority. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Terry. I know you're a busy man. And off to Jakarta next week yeah. to be even busier. Yeah. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure as always. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. If you like what you hear, then please like us and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much.